it is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Nathan Adam Kupperman II, DMD. He's a 32-year-old Florida native who enjoys surfing and traveling the world. He graduated from Florida State University in 2011 with a Bachelor of Science degree and earned his doctorate of medicine in 2015. Dr. Kupperman's grandfather was a dentist during the Great Depression, which contributed to his initial interest in the field. He's been dedicated to the pursuit of dentistry since he was 18 years old when he began working as a dental assistant during his undergraduate studies. He then worked as a frontline clinician in nearly a dozen offices after he graduated from dental school prior to his current practice ownership. Through these clinical experiences, he was encountered various leadership and team dynamics and has aimed to form a collaborative work culture in his own practice that helps elevate dentists and increase the quality of clinical outcomes in patient care. His personal philosophy is treat people how you would like to be treated. He's an advocate of continued education and advancement and is passionate about being a mentor to dentists, interested in thriving in the industry. NAK Dental Group is a dental provider organization founded in 2018 by Dr. Nathan. NAC Dental currently supports five dental locations across Northwest Florida. They offer a variety of management services from their administrative headquarters in Tallahassee, Florida, in addition to affiliation and partnership opportunities for dentists across the United States. He's decided to expand the reach and services of NAC Dental in order to fulfill his purpose of helping transition ownership of dental practices. This is accomplished by providing dentists wanting to transition out of their ownership stakes with flexibility and options to do so, and by providing long-term associate positions and equity partner opportunities to doctors joining the NAC platform. NAC Dental is proud to follow core values that are consistent across the practices, including clinical autonomy, for their providers, providing care to their communities through philanthropic services, strong retention systems for patients, staff, and doctors, and consistent and mindful growth and improvement. He strongly believes that while they treat teeth, we are all in the people business. Their cohesive teams provide care and support for one another, will continue to provide quality care for their loyal patients, and amazing work environment for their staff and doctors for so many come years to come. Dude, you have entrepreneur written all over you. Head to toe, you're an entrepreneur. <laughs> love watching you. Love watching you going, and already have five offices out of the gate. I mean, that is crazy success. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good, man. I, I never, never would have dreamed of it. Actually, been on this podcast with you from looking at your first lecture at Nova Southeastern. Oh my gosh! So, uh, so I lectured to you back back then in the day. That was when um, I was with my son Ryan and a couple other boys. And after the lecture, we were doing a cruise, right? Yeah, people time and money, people time and money. I remember sitting there and I, I think it was my, like freshman year of dental school and it was one of the first lectures that actually made sense to me. <laughs> and you you actually taught me a technology thing at the time that just blew my mind right before I stepped on the cruise. I'd done lecturing. I think we were going back to the hotel or the cruise ship or whatever. And you told me um, that this new dating app, of course, I'm an old grandpa uh, and um, you know I, I think of Match.com and you said, well, this tender app on the phone he says on the desktop it doesn't have gps positioning and this tender is taking everybody by storm because it knows where you are and of course every time i hear anything identify and i thought to myself wow could you imagine on dental town if you followed like 10 townies and they were these were your best friends and you walk into a a big dental convention and it had that gps deal and it showed you that two of your friends were there and you could message him. So I was calling Ken before I got on the cruise ship, telling him everything you told me. I'd already downloaded the Tinder app and it had, and was just all, just all excited. And guess what? It's finally done. Like now, I mean, we're we're it's in beta testing right now. It was a. Um, Is it? Wow, yeah, that's fantastic. Well, we're, and the initial inspiration. <laughs> No, no, absolutely. And, and, but that's what young kids need to know. Like, um, a lot of times when Jeff Bezos was talking, you know, the reporter wants to say about there's asking about something that they're doing right now. And, and he seems a little confused. He's like, okay, now you got to remember, I was totally on top of this when we decided to start this five years ago. And I'm, I'm on to, you know, three other things now. So he has to go back to his history book to try to think of what's going on. And it just takes time when you're young, you think you're going to solve all the world's problems by Friday. And then by the time you get about 40, you know, my new year's resolutions when I was in high school and college and over to my practice, they were, you know, they were five pages long and now they're like, okay, next year, if I could just accomplish just one thing, what would it be? 
And then, then maybe a second less weighted and a third less weighted, but the list could never be longer than three. And if you can just get one of your dreams done a year. So what, what, what is your New Year's? What is your, what is your, your, your New Year's resolution this year? Well, um, my, my, I, 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 I actually just got started. I just got vaccinated on the way here. I mean, I, uh, I don't know if I have a sticker on my shirt or whatever, but uh, she gave me one. But get out of here! Got, did you yeah. did you get did you get Moderna or did you get the the Pfizer? The, the the Pfizer BioNTech um, at the Arizona State Fairgrounds, and you made an appointment online. Thank you. Shout out to Lewis Core for sending me the link. Got registered, and um, you pull in. And there's like ten check stations. It look it was the most organized thing I'd ever. See, you just go from station to station. You never get out of your car. Um, I was so intelligent that I wore a long sleeve shirt. So I, uh, um, you know, that that was not the brightest thing I did today. And um, got this shot. And I tell you what, I psychologically feel really, really relieved. I mean, I feel like, because it's an old man's disease. I mean, when, when Corona came through in 2012, it killed 38 million souls in America, but it was all baby pigs and it just bacon went up. And this one came back, and thank God I didn't get the babies, but, you know, old men like me, um, males are about 60% of the uh, the DAS. Um, 60, I mean, I, th- this was not going to be pretty for me. And a shout-out to my friends right now who are having difficulty breathing in the hospital. You know who you are. Hang in there, man. I got, oh, my gosh. And um, I'm just, uh, I just feel like I finally see light at the end of the tunnel. I, th- I think the vaccine is critical to recovery and I'm really trying to offer it to all my staff. It's kind of interesting because I recently just sent out, you know, like a company wide email um, saying, you know, that I'm going to be offering uh, the Moderna vaccine to all the employees, but it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, it's a, it's kind of a 50, 50 where some people want it. And then some people are naturally, you know, skeptical because it is, it is a newer vaccine, but as you know, somebody who's middle-aged, I think it's a no brainer, especially after that first booster shot. I mean, that, that provides some significant protection. So uh, congratulations to you for getting it. Cause that's, that's, that's huge. That's definitely gotta be a big relief and help you sleep better at night. Yeah. And, and, you know, um, I, I know these, uh, there's been a crazy year between, um, you know, politics and inequality and racial and all, all these things like that. But, um, you know, I, I always think that, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And we, we had to learn a lot about ourselves and as a nation, as a people, as a populace. And again, um, you know, um, I, th- I think when the government um, gets to a point where they start marginalizing you, like you can't fly, you can't drive, they're going to like ruin your life if you don't do what they say and get a vaccine. I, I, I think that's, that's, um, that's not going to work ever. And um, I, I thought with the whole um, way this thing was handled that, you know, individual rights are individual rights and you have the right to lick a rat um, during the bubonic plague. I mean, it's your 50,000 people kill themselves each year. I don't know who these people are that think living under an authoritarian government that makes all your decisions is a good idea. I mean, I, I miss mm-hmm. that in the 5,000 year history of, uh, of, um, from, of, of modern civilization. I mean, it just, it just never works. I, I never trust any of those guys. But um, so if um, I was very surprised too in my own dental office, um, more than half don't want to get it. Um, you know, <laughs> um, there's a threat on dental tap. My staff doesn't want to get it. Dude, your staff doesn't want to get it. I mean, you know, that that's okay. I mean, it is what it is. Yeah. At least the least I can do is offer it and they can, they can do their own research and they can make an educated decision. So. But. Yeah, and um, my gosh, you got you got to respect the individual, or it never ends well. And um, you know, it's just um, it's just unendable. Well. And and I and I like the um, that you're going going to this DSOs because you know so many words trigger people, and DSO is a trigger word. I mean, you just say DSO, and half the dentists on dental sounds start you know convulsing, you know, and and all that kind of stuff. And 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 the way I see DSO is number one, it to me it's group practice. I mean. The ocean at the end of the day, I mean, the ocean's, you know, 70% of the earth, two and a half miles deep, but I can still just fill this little bottle of water with ocean. I mean, you can keep making it down to one water molecule, and the one water molecule of a DSO is a group practice. And then it goes group practice, multi-location, like you have five locations. And who actually owns it? I mean, Wall Street doesn't want to touch it. There's not one of them publicly traded in America. Um, there's two in Australia and one in um, um, Singapore, but there's none over here after OCA showed them what a DSO looked like. No one will touch one again until all those old brokers on Wall Street are dead and gone. But it's group practice. And some individuals, dentists feel shamed 
because they don't want to do what you do. They don't have, I mean, look at you. I mean, you're picture perfect. You look like you came from the cover of GQ. And if you're enthusiastic and want to lead five offices, that's awesome. But there's five other dentists who think what, what you do, they, they'd rather just go work at Taco Bell and throw in their license if they had all that on their head. You know what I mean? So if you're <laughs> a mom and you have two kids yeah. and you really have a hard time getting your kid um, to stop using a sippy cup, you know, how, how are you going to get your hygienist to call all their patients, uh, you know, that didn't uh, reschedule for their six month recall before they leave work? End of story. No questions asked. So, you know, each of their own. If you want the vaccine, fine. If, if you if you like making decisions, be an owner. If you'd rather just take orders, be an employee, and there's nothing right or wrong with either one. You know, I'll give you another example, pediatric dentistry. Good God, if that's what I had to end up being, I would have quit. I wouldn't even have graduated from dental school. I knew I knew jun- junior year, first hour of clinic, that that had to be rock bottom. And and my pediatric dentist friends, they love it. It's the same thing with, with ownership, DSOs. I mean, there's a, there's a, hell, your last name is cop. There's a lid for every cop. <laughs> And, and maybe, you know, maybe Nathan Adam Cup Ehrman ha- is, is the leader guy, and maybe someone else is the leader guy. Um, God, I remember when I got out of school, the most challenging thing to me was molar endo. I mean, I, I spent five years of my life with G. John Chofel and, and um, you know, going to Chattanooga and seeing uh, um, all, all the greats, um, you know. But, um, um, my gosh, if, if it's your cup of tea, rock on. And if it's not your cup of tea, There's, you don't yeah. have to do it. Yeah, there, there really is so many different types of dentists. And, and Howard, just like you, I think pediatric dentistry is definitely my Achilles heel. Um, and when you say dental service organization, I try to refer to us more as a dental provider organization, you know, like an organization that supports providers, providers, we work together to elevate each other to elevate, you know, our clinical outcomes. But again, too, like you're saying, there's, there's different dentists for different roles. There's some dentists that you were saying, you know, they want to make decisions, they want to, they want to be in charge. And then there's other dentists that are in that, that, that phase where they want to be mentored and they want to develop. And then there's also other dentists that, you know, they're just perfectly honest with, with uh, you know, clocking in and clocking out and doing the dentistry and going home and not having to worry about it. Cause you and me both know that ownership is it's a, it's a seven day a week thing. I mean, you, you know, it never sleeps. You got HR, you got payroll, you got overhead, you got a lot of different things. There's always little fires and sometimes big fires to put out. <laughs> so, but yeah. And it reminds me of so many lessons because I used to always hear so many people always make fun. You know, back in the day when it was more of a man's profession, all the uh, spouses were office managers because the man was a dentist and the wife was uh, an office manager. Well, and now it's it's the opposite where you now now you're always having women dentists for their husbands the office manager. But I'd always hear these deals about the the dentist wife, which now would be the dentist spouse. And I could figure it out in like three seconds. You know, I'd be in there talking to him. And as soon as the doc went to the bathroom, whatever, just me and her, and I said, I just sat there and say, just between me and you, do you like your job working here? <laughs> and she, and nine times out of ten, she, if there if it was an issue, she'd say, I freaking hate it. I got three kids in daycare. I, I want to be a mom. I, I mean, now I'm blah, blah, blah. And it's like, good God. Don't ever, I mean, we're talking about a dentist doesn't want to be an owner. And then that same dentist will go start his own practice, make his wife uh, an office manager. I mean, you only want people in a job they want to be in. I mean, we, we're yeah. not in a forced labor. I, uh, yeah, I think spousal staff isn't the wisest choice, you know. I mean, it's always it's always good to, you know, have your space and have your independence and then be able to reunite and, you know, love each other. But when it comes down to office managers, I think office managers are absolutely one of the most critical things. And I actually learned that from you, Howard Fram, because you always told me that when you're MBA in a day, you always said that the office manager is the heartbeat of the office. It's the most crucial part of the office. So you literally have to have the, the biggest cheerleader, the biggest, the biggest leader in there that's very, you know, motivated and is a really good people person. And I would think if you talk to any of my office managers, that they would tell you that they really do enjoy their job because it's challenging. And it's fulfilling and it's also very rewarding. Right. And you didn't, and, and look at the interview you had when you brought on your office manager. 
then look at the interview you had in the back seat of a truck uh, when you interviewed your wife. You know what I mean? These, these are <laughs> two separate interviews that have nothing in common with each other. There's definitely a bias. There's definitely a bias there in yeah. the hiring process. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and another thing, you know, like um, these dentists would always ask, you know, anytime they saw me with any of my boys, they always say, so are you going to be a dentist like your dad? And, and I already lived through that with Sonic driving. I mean, I broke my dad's heart that I didn't want to do – Sonic drive-ins all day long, and it was a, that would have been a great option. And his other partner's sons had most of them had two or three Sonic drive-ins before I even got out of dental school. But I, I didn't want to do that. But I would always like to point out to my boys. I'd say, um, you know, I, I'd tell my boys, I didn't have you for cheap labor or free labor. You had to follow me. I, I had you for you, and I just want you to enjoy the biosphere, you know, for a, a century. And um, I would always point out to them that the most miserable dentist I've ever known were ones that went into dentistry reluctantly drag kicking and screaming, but a really strong mom or dad pulled them into it. And, mm-hmm. and uh, I'd always, I'd always show my boys, you know, those examples. And I'd say, you know, at the end of the day, your dad just wants you to be happy and healthy. You know what I mean? And you're only going to yeah. do that doing something you love. And, and if molar endo, I had another friend who's uh, up the street from me said he'd rather be taken in the backyard and beat than do a molar root canal. And I said, well, dude, there's 4,000 endodontists. You don't need to, you don't need to do that to yourself. But the other thing, but one, my, one more point about group practice. The thing I loved about group practice the most is that, um, and I, I started group right out of the, uh, the start just for psychological reasons, because sometimes you'll be looking for an MB2 for like 45 minutes and you'll just give up and walk away. But a new fresh set of eyes walks in there and just drops the sixth file right in it. Exactly. Um, and and when you when you are young and you start getting nervous, like, oh my god, am I going to be able to get this tooth out? You start going into fear mode. But if you know Nick Gidwani's sitting back there and can come pull this thing out in like eight nanoseconds, so just relax. I I, I love group. And then if there's an employee that you just obviously don't have any form of chemistry with you know then then you could have well maybe maybe you should talk to that hygienist you know what i mean i mean i don't have any chemistry rapport but group group is just awesome if the leader the fish rots from the head down it's all got to start with a leader um who shares your values yes sir yeah absolutely i really i really do agree with that though and it's funny too i just it's like listening to you talk about this it's just identical you know when you get these new grads they come in and they are very gun shy they're very nervous but if they they know that they have somebody there in the background to support them um that's that's a huge confidence boost and it's just it's been amazing that i've you know i've seen uh, quite a few of my clinicians it's like how quickly they developed you know under my mentorship and under the other you know the uh, retiring doctor's mentorship and like how quickly they developed compared to, to how I developed. I feel like I developed so slowly. I feel like after two years, I didn't have any confidence and you have, you know, some of these docs that are, you know, 10 to 12 months out and it's like, they're doing really good. Sometimes it's like they're diagnosing, they're diagnosing more thoroughly than, than some of the other senior docs. So it's really, really fascinating what, what you can kind of create and how quickly you can elevate dentists, especially coming out of school, because when you first come out of school, it is, it's definitely, definitely scary. Don't you agree, Howard? Absolutely. But you know what? I wish you would um, just stop and um, go over your journey. I mean, all, all the young kids listening to this are like, walk us through. You got out of school, <laughs> you got five yeah. offices, and you're still a baby. So, so <laughs> walk us through that journey. It's it's an interesting story. It's funny too because I still walk into the operatory and my patients still ask me, you know, how how old are you? You know, how long have you been doing this for? I, I get grilled, and I feel like a lot of new grads can relate to that. But my my whole story is that when I graduated, I had a good relationship with a doctor in in my area in Tallahassee, and he had a nice fee for service Cush office, and I worked there for a couple of years, and I got to spend you know three hours figuring out how to do a molar root canal, or two hours trying to figure out how to you know take out a wisdom tooth. So I. It was a nice developmental time where I, I had some time, but then I started kind of dipping my fingers into Medicaid and other PPO offices. And then I kind of went out on my own and I began contracting at about a dozen offices. So I was contracting a bunch of different offices, kind of seeing how different teams worked, kind of seeing different types of dentistry, different, different, um, different patient base. And then during that process, there was three of the offices of the 12 that I was practicing at, the doctor was very um, motivated to sell. And this had to do with, you know, some tragedy. Um, his, his son, who was a dentist, had had got killed in an accident tragically. And then his um, other son, who was a dentist, you know, he left. It was, it was a big falling out. So you had three offices and one doctor that was really, you know, 
struggling in a sense. And he wanted, he wanted to figure out a way to retire because he was ready to retire. And then all of these things happened. So I was able to jump in and buy those offices. We got things turned around. The selling doctor stayed on, which was, which was huge. He was really good, good and supportive. And then eventually I replicated the model with a fourth office. And then the fifth office I just bought, I actually found out the doctor, he just left um, about like a week before. And I thought that he was going to stay. So that was an interesting scenario too. But yeah, five years later, I, I am where I am. And, you know, we have over 40, 40 employees. We have eight providers. I'm hoping to bring a few more providers on too soon. So it's, it's been, uh, it's been quite an interesting journey and a lot of uh, clinical development along the way. So you're in Tallahassee, Florida. So, um, for our international viewers, that's, um, Florida is, is an interesting state because the more South you go towards Miami, it's, it's Northern, um, it's Northeast, uh, United States. It's all New Yorkers and New Jersey's. And then the more North you go in Florida, the more it becomes the South because the, the top of Florida is the South of Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and you're up there in Tallahassee. Are all five of your locations in Tallahassee? So again, uh, Howard, you'll be very proud of me. You'll be very proud of me, but two, two of the offices are in Tallahassee, but the other three offices are heavily rural, very rural, kind of what you've always preached in a sense. So yeah. But, clo- but, but you- rural, rural Tallahassee, I mean like an hour or two drive or. Uh, about, states, about or? an hour to 45 minutes. So oh, that's kind nice. of like, the, that's kind of the radius. So yeah, but Tallahassee really is actually developing in a sense where there's a lot of people coming in. Um, but the other rural, the other areas are very rural. And uh, again, too, that's kind of just something that I had, I had learned from you initially. So, but, but do you agree that Florida, you know, the more South you go, the more North you get with the people from New York and New Jersey and the more North you go in Florida, the more, <laughs> Southern America. Absolutely. It's funny. The more North you go, I mean, you're like, it gets Southern Georgia, extremely Southern, Southern hospitality. And then you go to South Florida and it's like, you're in South America, you know, you got Colombians and Brazilians and so much culture. And then you have the New Yorkers and New Jersey. And it's, 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 it's crazy. It's a complete, it's a completely um, counterintuitive to what you would think. So, um, I want to, I want to go straight to, uh, the dentistry uncensored, the, uh, the part, uh, that's, no one agrees on is the most controversial. That, 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 that is a DSO model. Um, I mean, uh, I, I, I love your post on Dental Town. Um, let, let, let's talk about um, you, you posted one on um, um, an equity company, Viper Equity, uh, under the practice transition, practice acquisitions. W- what have you learned about private equity so far on your journey? And does that affect your business model or banking finance versus selling part like Rick Kirshner, you know, he sold all partnerships to fund his, his whole comfort dental was funded. He has no associates. Um, everybody that come in, you're either an owner operator or not. And, um, uh, the typical comfort dental has like two docs pay, you know, a franchise fee and that pays for the land and building and the practice of, uh, the comfort dental. So then Rick's out of it. He has no money into it, then signs him a 10-year rental lease. And that that's really the business model. It's, it's more like a McDonald's. That's the McDonald's business model. I mean, the McDonald's franchise, they just take the land, the building, the guts. It's, you know, it's obviously going to be a lot cheaper in Salina, Kansas than Manhattan and whatever the land building and, and the whole thing costs. That's a franchise fee. Then a McDonald's, you just got to give them 14% off the top for the rest of your life. But you can't do that in dentistry because that's fee splitting and illegal. But Rick does it lean and clean and mean with just... Just, just sign a ten-year, you know, uh, deal. He has like every, every the first day of every month, he has like three hundred dental offices paying him a rent check on three hundred paid-off dental practices. But where is your funding at now? I mean, I, I see you post about um, private equity. Everybody here thinks of DSOs as big private equity and venture capital, and others are transition. Where, where are you at right now with monetizing your business model growth? Um, honestly, that's a really good question. Cause I'm, <laughs> I'm not exactly quite sure. So right now, you know, I'm at five offices and right now I am the sole owner. So you can obviously imagine that, you know, there's, there's a lot of responsibility involved in being a sole ownership of five offices and all these employees. But what I'm, what I'm more interested in is less monetizing and more about growing right now and finding the right doctors to, to partner that are, that have that entrepreneurial mindset and actually, you know, can start to get some skin in the game with the offices. Cause I think that there's a lot of potential, especially with, you know, what I've been able to, to accomplish because I, 
was practicing as an associate contractor um, two years ago. And within two years, you know, we've built up to five offices in the size that we've gotten. So monetizing isn't something I really think about right now. For me, I like to, I like to network with business guys, I like to network with financing guys, because I feel like every single one, every single individual can give you some kind of good insight or feedback. But right now, I just think that we're in like, we're kind of like in our, our prenatal stage, you know, we're, we're, there's so much potential ahead of us. And I think that, I think that we have, you know, a long runway before, before anything like that would even come to mind. And, you know, um, the final business model and, and something new like this, I mean, I mean, look at cars, look at Henry Ford's first car and look at a Ford 350 today. I mean, who, it doesn't look anything like a Model T. And I, I, I um, always said that the, the final DSO business model is, isn't even invented yet because uh, my, my God, because um, um, some companies like, like consulting, like Boston group and, Boston consulting and all that stuff. They, they were, they were well into this before I even started college. They already had partnerships. Look at law firms. Half the lawyers are individuals, half the law firms are in a big size group and they've been, you know, having all these ways to make partnership for years. And I, I look at dentistry, um, it, it's kind of a brand new, I, I guarantee you when you're as old as me and you have six grandkids, <laughs> um, it's going to look so different than it does now. Um, but, um, but right now you are, 100% all owner, no, not a legal partner with anyone. Yeah, no legal partners. Are you, no are you married? Equity. Are you married? No, I'm not married. I'm oh, not married. my God. The first official genius on Dentaltown. He's not married <laughs> and has five locations with no partners because uh, because it's a marriage. Um, you, when, when you get a partnership with a dentist, it's called a platonic marriage. And everything they do that is annoying is in your face eight hours a day, five days a week. Like, say, say he's doing dentistry with open contacts or say he wants to be a cosmetic dentist or, you know, he's doing an, an initial three-hour TMJ new patient exam on a nine year old whose mother's looking at him like, are you stoned? Uh, you know, I mean, just, you know, that stuff's in your face all day long. But when you got a spouse that does something really, really annoying, you might not only even see it once a week. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. uh, marrying another dentist, my God, that is a big, that's as big as the commitment is getting married. <laughs> And it's people a big just, step. Yeah. yeah, I think I, 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 you're kind of right though. I feel like, you know, when you're working with dentists, it is a lot like, it's a lot like dating, honestly, you know, you meet the dentist, you, you get to know each other, you see if your, you know, clinical philosophies match and then the relationship begins and then you guys start practicing together. And it's for me too. It's like, I like to, I like to kind of feed doctors dentistry. I like to do the new patient exams. I like I like to kind of show them treatment planning. I like to, you know, help to help develop them, but it's a lot, it's a lot of, um, it's like, it's, it really is like dating. And it's to think that, you know, to get to a point where I would want to get married with someone one day, you know, event, maybe, maybe I would, if I, if I found the right fit for, for a partner, but you're absolutely right. That is a big commitment. And I just let, you know, learn from a lot of the other greats that, you know, partnerships can go south real, real quickly. Right. And it's about the media because, you know, everybody knows the media's manufacturing. I mean, one of the most profound books I ever read in my life that blew my mind was um, uh, Noam Chomsky's book. Um, what was it? A manufactured media and manufacturing media. And and when he when I first read it, I thought, OK, is this like some old jaded guy who got burned too many times? And it, it, it's all it's all true. In fact, now he's 90 years old and lives in the next town over in Tucson. But um, the partnerships are great that media is controlled by all the people that sell partnerships and that's how they all make a living and so the only thing these young dentists are going to hear is from the guy selling the partnership same thing with the dso's when you go to dental school i mean dentists are cheap in dental school you walk in there with 20 large cheese pizzas and you're going to get a whole audience you know what i mean they will they will listen to propaganda for pepperonis Every mm -hmm. time. So they're always think, hearing the yeah. DSO I think, one, I think one thing too, when you're saying, you know, propaganda, I feel like right now, I mean, there's, there's no propaganda with my organization. And it's funny too, Howard, when you say, you know, I always talk to dentists and I recruit them and I say, Hey, listen, this is my organization. I can sell it. I, I can, I'm a good salesman. I can sell you on it. I can tell you it's amazing. I'm like, how about you talk to three or four or five of the dentists that have been working with me? I'm like, I, that's, that's my best thing is to have the associates sell my company and not me. And I try to treat my associates, you know, as so well and as good as I can. So, you know, they can, it, it's, it really is a domino effect. I mean, you've seen how quickly I've grown and how many providers I've gotten that I treat 
you know, doctors right. I mentor them right. And then it, it, it returns tenfold. So, well, you know, that um, I, I want you to um, share. I, I want to go to a different subject now. And that is um, on a post you thread about um, um, what did you, what was that one called? Um, DSO business structures, because there's a lot of controversy or problems on dental town where people are saying, okay, well that guy says that he's a, a, a partner in uh, an office of, of Aspen or Pacific or Heartland or whatever. And, and, and some people argue, well, what does that really mean? I mean, so what, what does it really mean to you when someone says that they work for a big DSO with 500 more locations? They say, well, I'm, I'm a partner of in with Heartland or Aspen or Fontana versus, I mean, cause obviously the business model is changing daily. Um, how do, how does the partnership, model look the variance of them in dental dso's today in your mind i think it's very complex because i know that you know different states have different rules and regulations and i think that the way that you know heartland and aspen and the other big organizations are structured is they have separate management companies that do specific duties that are legal and then there's separate entities that are linked to that and the dentistry is performed in the separate entities that are tied to a dentist. And I think that's probably one of the one of the biggest forms. Now, as per partnerships, I'm assuming that the dentist would get partnership within those those separate structures that are the practices where the dentistry is being practiced. But I have, you know, quite a few friends that are, that are really happy with Aspen and they've they've bought into some of their offices too. But I think it works to where you know you get some partial equity of the existing office, but you never actually get equity in the in the full blown management company. And I also too, I've, you know, heard of ways of maybe offering a stock options and I'm, I'm not sure if, but I'm sure some of the organizations do that, but you know, they, they issue heavy stock and then, you know, it's stock within the company and then over time, you know, it can go up, but that's a way to, you know, retain people and keep people motivated on company growth. As for me and my partnership, I mean, I don't, I don't even have partnerships yet, but I would think it would be more ideal that the, the dentist would get equity and the offices that they help grow and that they're in. Um, and not the entire organization. But what are your thoughts on that, Howard? Oh, it's it is very complicated. I mean, there's you know like a you know DSOs. You know, there's a the large S corp. You know that owns all the offices. Usually employs all dentists as independent contractors or W two employees. No ownership potential. There's the partnership models. Doctors own part of the office. Larger organization owns the rest. Um, franchise ownership with the royalties. Um, you know, there's, and, and there's a lot of hybrids out there. And the other thing that's confusing to our international audience is, um, you know, like, like I'm sure when I think of Canada, I think of Canada, but there's no comparison between British Columbia, Ontario, and Montreal and the United States is 50 States. And they all have so many different laws Mm -hmm. that, you know, if you're living in China, you might think, uh, it's McDonald's, right? Um, McDonald's in California is the same as in New York. It looks that simple, but when you get into all these regulations and health corps and then accountings with S corps and C corps and LLPs and PCs. I mean, like, like say, I, I, I think the model has yet to be determined and I think we're a long way away. And I think what I would start doing is working on the brand. I mean, because that's what Warren Buffett says. He says, look, if you give me a billion dollars, I mean, even, even, I mean, I'm a dentist. I'm drinking Diet Coke. I mean, I, I know this is a dumb idea and I always get the water, you know what I mean? I, 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 so at least every sip, I can at least know that, okay, I should be drinking the water, and I try mostly to. But Warren Buffett said, if you handed me a billion dollars and told me to go open up another soda company, I'm not going to do it. Because the brand of Coca-Cola is so huge, I'm going to burn through a billion dollars, and I'm not going to have that brand, that emotional feeling. I mean, little kids were were having Coke at their birthday party when they were two. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it's just a big brand, and right now... I'm in my um, little bubble here in Arizona and everybody sees the same thing um, from their own patients that they went to this big DSO and they um, it's kind of like a car wash. You know how you drive a lot further to go to the car wash because you just want to go to the car wash where you go in and the guy says, you want a one, two or three and uh, you say the whatever and you go get it. Then you go to the, the one by your house and he's like trying to fix a nick on your window and trying to tell you about this. And you're like, dude, I just want my car wash, but you got to sit through a whole sales pitch and it's like, you know what? Just, just avoid the sales pitch. I'm going to drive four miles down the road just so I can have some guy ask me, you want one, two or three. And, uh, and right now in, um, um, 
dentistry, I think the DSOs are still trying to do the wham, bam, treat you, ma'am, where they're going to give you a big sales pitch, a big treatment plan, and then when the patient comes back, the doctor's not there. And so they're trying to get a lot of money up front instead of looking at the lifetime value of this patient. I mean, like, like when ortho, the reason orthodontists spend twice as much money on advertising, they spend about 6% plus, is because they're going to get 6500 bucks in a two-year period. The dentist only spends about 3% because they're going to get the same 6500 bucks, but it's going to be over a five-year period. And, um, and I just have so many patients who um and come back and say well you know i wanted to go there because they were open or this or that or whatever that whatever reason they had a coupon or whatever and and but every time they go back it's a different dentist it's like dude you're a dental office rule number one let's keep the dentist why 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 do you lose a dentist well number one the owner owns a lab and you can only send your crowns to this lab. Well, you know, Dennis, they can't even agree on if a crown is acceptable or not, let alone the same lab. Are you out of your flipping mind? Um, charity, mm-hmm. philanthropy. Um, someone comes in, it's a sad story, and, and he's like, I didn't go to dental school to make money. I, you, you, you have a problem. I, I, I'm, I'm going to take care of this myself. Then the office manager says, you can't do that. You can't do charity dentistry, and I'm the dentist. I mean, so, again, it's, it's taking all these freedoms and options away but, but you're saying though you're back to back to the crowns i feel like that is one thing that can be a, a make or break is you know the lab and the crowns now the crowns don't fit or if you're sitting there for you know 30 minutes to an hour you know trying to adjust the crown and sometimes i feel like it's better to pay a little bit more and those, cl- those crowns drop in than otherwise one thing too that is i think has been a huge stride in prosthodontics and uh you know crowns in general has been the, you know the scanners um i i use itero scanners at my office but that helps like everybody kind of get on the same page or, you know, you know, the quality of the margins is going to be pretty good. And I'm really, really big on having all the dentists agree. You know, I'm constantly, it's like a quality check. I'm constantly checking in with the doctors. Hey, how are those crowns seating? How are the crowns doing? How are the contacts? Um, you know, how is it looking? And the second I feel like it's getting off track, you know, I, I get in contact with the lab. So you really have to have the lab tur- turned in and tuned in because you're absolutely right that that's a quick way to, you know, piss off a, a dentist and have them go, have them leave. Well, let, let, that, those are great points. Let's stay in Ontario, um, dental town right now. Today's act topic: Is it possible to use Itero scanner to make digital dentures? Digital dentures? No, I mean I haven't not done that. But I like Itero just because of of true presentation, and I like Itero about a quick Invisalign turnaround. It's really easy to get a nice scan, send it off to Invisalign, it comes back, and if you need to do a refinement. It's not this whole ordeal of I have to take new impressions and do this and do that and wait a couple of weeks for the refinement to come back. Right now, it's like Itera has streamlined refinements to where it makes the whole process of ortho better. And also, it, it makes the doctors a lot more comfortable because they can do that chair side before and after clinic check. And they can see instantly if it's a difficult case or if it's a hard case, they give you notifications. So it's really it's a really helpful tool. And patients are just amazed by it, honestly. And I know there's a lot of really good other good scanners out there, but I think the lock that Itero has with that line, how there's that exclusivity with the with the scans going to Invisalign. I think that's what's really keeping Itero um, above the competition right now. And I, I just want to say um, a couple add a couple points to what you're saying is um, number one, um, Joe Hogan, um, who's the uh, CEO of Align Technology, they own Invisalign and Itero scanner. And it seems like if you're going down the road of bleaching, bonding veneers, Invisalign, clear deals, Invisalign is what everybody usually ends up um, uh, choosing. If you go the other way, blood and guts implants, it seems that um, three shape um, out of uh, Copenhagen um, is uh, seems to be the preferred one. If um, you're just doing if you're just doing implants, all you need is a scanner and a solid scan body, and you're dropping in implants left and right. Your restorations are perfect. So if you're just doing that, then obviously you know like Medit or Three Shape or any of the other scanners will will suffice as long as it's accurate. Uh, so I want to ask you this question. Uh, I want to say on Itero, um, a dentist says today, uh, should I buy a scanner or CBCT first? I do a lot of endo, including molars. Absolutely, absolutely, a scanner. You got to get a scanner first. CBCT, a uh, CBCT we have as well, but I just, I feel like a scanner is you're going to start um, presenting a lot more dentistry and it's going to get to a point where you're overwhelmed with dentistry and then you're really going to need, you know, CBCT to, to further your diagnosis. But that's just, that's just me firsthand because I feel like you can diagnose a lot of basic dentistry with a pano and a PA 
and um, and using the iTerra. If you're starting to get more advanced and you know you're you're not certain, and having a CBCT is good. But for me too, initially before I got one, I actually had a local orthodontist who had one. So if I was unsure, I had you know I had my scanner that I was using, and then if I really needed a scan, I would refer to a to get that scan. So that's just that's just my two cents. Well, that's that's why you have five offices with your two cents. Because when most people think of a scanner, they're thinking of you know, um, should I use polyvinyl suloxone or a scanner? And the dental journey goes as follows: when you're in dental school, it's one two dentistry, and all you want to do is get that MOD composite done and checked out. And it takes usually dentists like five years before they come to the conclusion: well, you know, if I'm going to have this number thirty numb, I'm going to have the whole quadrant numb. My God, why don't we do the whole quadrant? And then it takes about another five five years to say, well, why don't we, if we're going to do the lower right, why don't we just do the right side? And then they stop there because they say, well, I don't want to numb up the whole mouth because that would mean that oral surgeons uh, don't exist because they, I guess they live with mermaids and unicorns because uh, they numb up all four quadrants on eight people a day, five days a week, their entire life. And then in the same medical dental building, the other seven dentists make everybody come back because you can't numb up both sides. But, but, The dentists all go to dental school and come out saying, I'm not a salesman, dude. I didn't go to eight years of college to be a used car salesman. And and, um, treatment plan presentation, I mean, Mm -hmm. if you're going to talk treatment plan presentation, you might as well tell everybody you're a pinko communist, uh, you know, and you want to overthrow America. I mean, that'd probably be more politically. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they, they, so what do you do with your partners? um, When you can't say sell dentistry, but I inverse that as to my grandkids. If my grandkids could go to two dentists when I'm gone and both dentists accurately diagnosed each had a cavity, but one convinced them to open up their wallet and pull out their debit card and get it done. And the other one thought, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, don't know. I think I'm just going to wait till I have it, you know. So selling dentistry is all about dentistry. If you can't sell dentistry, you're not a dentist. You're not going to be doing dentistry, but all the dentists hate that. So yeah, how do you- Howard, I, I can completely agree with you on that. But I like, again, as I like to stay away from DSO, um, I also like to stay away from the word sales. Because what is what is sales, Howard, and what does doctor mean in Latin to teach, right? Sales is education. So when I try to express to doctors, I say, you're not selling the patient. You're educating them to make the best decision in spite of themselves. You know, and the best the best analogy that I make is like a mother convincing their son to go to college as opposed to going to work at McDonald's. She convinces her son, she educates him to go to college and become a better person. So that's the way that I like to put it. And it's it's really, it's tough. It's tough to, to try to pitch sales to hygienists, to dentists, but you have to the pitch the concept of education and that you're over, you're helping people through education. So that's 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 my angle. Well put, and I can also prove it. There's a lot of very rich, famous, popular dentists who we all know the names of, and they always talk about this new patient exam and this $50,000 treatment plan. But what they don't ever tell you is that all their patients are dentists because dentists went to eight years of college. They value that type of stuff, and they have money, but they their lecture makes it come off like this is just what some guy you know, driving a 10 year old truck gets every day in Coffeyville, Kansas. And it's just, it's just further from truth. So it's all education based. And, um, um, so what tips would you give to someone, um, to educate their patients more specifically with an iTero scanner? I mean, cause a lot of people are thinking, well, how, how does he connect an iTero scanner to treatment plan presentation? I like, I like the, the eye record in general, right? You know, it's like, I feel like in dental school, you know, you had to take impressions, you had to mount models with a face bow. I mean, it was like hour long process, you know, hours and hours you put in to having a diagnostic cast in a model. And now I can literally sit the patient down and I can do a two minute scan and have a full blown diagnostic cast with bite register, you know, with bite to see the eye bite to see, you know, where the bite's heavy. And if they're, if they're bruxing or, you know, if they have, you know, big amalgams or they have decay, it shows up on that scan. So I can go to the individual arches and I can zoom in and show them what's going on. And I always tell the patient, it's one thing if I tell you, it's another thing if you see it. So I feel like the Itero scanner in combination with intraoral photos, it's like the silver bullet. I think if any dentist, any new grad or any dentist that's not doing this starts doing this, they're going to see their tr- their treatment acceptance go through the roof because you really talk less and you show more. And I think that's that's very, very effective. Well, well put. and um. 
So do you, a lot of them say um, think they got to be um, a salesman, or they got to be the, you know they got to be more salesy, or they got to uh, come in with the clothes or things like that. How how are you psychologically educated? And by the way, the first name for Dental Town got vetoed by uh, my dad, my sister, my ex. It was Docere.com. It was Docere. <laughs> And because that's the Latin word for doctor, meaning to teach. And everybody said, okay, Howard, you went to Catholic mass every day. That was in Latin until you were 10. No one else is going to make that connection than you You just said it. But how do you, um, what, what's going through your mind to where you, you want to educate them to accept treatment without selling? I mean, how is it a, is it a short thing? Is it, do you usually, one appointment taking models, another appointment presentation? How, how do you do it? No, no, no. It's it's in the chair, same day. I mean, I'm a huge proponent of same day dentistry, just in general, and a lot of things. Obviously, more comprehensive stuff is the same day. But you know, if I if I you know, if I see a patient that doesn't really need anything, I'm not going to sit there and waste my time and do a scan unless they need ortho or something. But if it's someone who they really need some comprehensive care, then I can do that scan. I think one of my biggest go tos though is the intraoral camera because that's a quick, you know, single tooth hurting picture you need this it's it's a good agreement but it's it's an interesting question when you ask me you know how how do i get the doctors on board and i think the biggest thing is they got to believe in the education process they got to believe that they're that they're a mouth doctor you know that they're that they're helping humans and i think if you become passionate about that you become so passionate about the dentistry that you want to educate the patient so bad that you know you want you want to help them so i think that's that's the way to, to do it obviously there's a lot of different um books and stuff that you can read um, it's human to sell is like one that you always like to recommend. Um, and um, I, I like Grant Cardone seller be sold because he just he's got a philosophy of where you know you have to kind of brainwash yourself into really believing like how how amazing how amazing your your quality is. So and, and, yeah. I, and I've had Grant on the show twice. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I have. Did you know that? I got I got to check it out because I, I like um, that guy. He's, he's he's a character. Yeah, he he's a character. But um, the thing is, um, what what I what I like about him, he's just he's just fearless, and he, he gets some you know the same thing with rich dad poor dad. Like some people get all caught up on, um, is that guy's story true? Did he really have a rich dad? It's like, dude, it, it's kind of like you tell when you tell someone something the most profound thought you had all day, and they only come back as well. You said there, T H E I R, but it's T H E R E, and it's like really, really, you're ever what I just said, and you're you're gonna pull out some um, English dentists, Nazi grammar. Yeah. Dentists are hypercritical. You know, there's that joke: how many dentists does it take to screw in a light bulb? Two. You have one dentist screwing in the light bulb, and you have another dentist critiquing it. It's a classic saying. Yeah, <laughs> and my joke on the dentist is: you know why dentists um, um, argue so much? Why it's is that? It's because the stakes are so low. <laughs> um, you know, um, so I, I mean, they do, they, 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 they argue about this stuff that doesn't even matter. Um, so there was a, uh, there was a deal with, um, Itero, um, just last question on Tarot where, um, um, God, what was it? That was, um, the Itero 2.9 scanner. They stopped supporting it. Um, April. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. That was a lot of fun having to change all my scanners. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that to, to, to the people who did, don't, don't know what happened. Um, um, what, what happened? It's, it's again, iTero is a great product, but I mean, they definitely have a way of, I mean, once you're in iTero, I feel like you're, you're in it pretty good because I remember, so, you know, one of the, one of the first things that happened to me, you know, I'm new to practice ownership, you know, just bought three offices, have all these bills piling in, you know, lots of stress. And then I find, I come to find out, I had no idea, but all three scanners at each of my offices needed to be replaced. It was like all thirty thousand dollars each, you know. So it's just like this. It's just stuff like that that can that can definitely throw you throw you off. But again, too, you know, they do have that that trade in policy to where you can get a you know a large credit for trading in your old scanner. So they and, definitely and why and they why did they do they, that? They, yeah. Why why did they do that? Um, I think to entice you to to buy the products because I think it's I think it's a very expensive product. So then if they give you a large credit. But again, too, I think ballpark when it comes at the end of the day, if you're doing a trade in, you know, I think the price wise, I feel like it's almost it's pretty competitive to, to what the other things, what the other scanners are and what you what you get exactly. And I, I, again, you got to you got to be a certain type of dentist. You have to be very interested in ortho or or that that scanner is not worth it. Yeah. Um, it, it, so, you know, it's it's one of the things where I, I don't like the word right or wrong. 
because mm-hmm. it's it's such a I mean it's it's not like up down left right right or wrong. Usually these things are complex, multifactorial, and there's a trade off between having a closed system like my iPhone and an open system like an Android. And I've seen a lot of data, but here's where I I call bullshit. I've seen a lot of dentists that say, well, I don't want to get lo- um, um, Dentist Fly Serona was a perfect one when they had their CAD cam and everything went together and all that. And dentists would say, well, you know, I don't want to get locked in. I, 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 I want an open system. Okay, so then they got an open system. And I say, okay, well, you just took a CBCT. Um, burn it for me on a CD-ROM because I want to take it for a second opinion. Nobody in the office has a clue to how to do this. You know what I mean? Nobody. It's like, okay, so when you have five different softwares because you want this open system, well, you're supposed to be like a tech nerd geek that loves to figure out how they all seamlessly work together. But if that's not yeah. you, then a closed system like an Apple or an iPhone or a, um, a, a Serac machine is great. So if you're a nerd tech guy, and I'm going to call bullshit on the remote control. In your house, when there's a problem on the TV and you hand someone else the remote control and say, can you find it? You're not the nerd tech guy. The guy you handed the remote control is the tech guy in your house. So you don't, so a closed system works great if you can't work a remote control. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And when you're saying too, you know, the CBCT process, it's, it's really easy to burn a, you know, a CBCT scan. And so, and the thing is too, is like all the doctors that, that I have working for me, you know, they each have like the, well, I do care stream too, but we have the, the software on our, on our laptop. So, you know, you can take a CBCT home and you can review it on your laptop and I'm review it on another computer. Same thing with Itero. I like how there's that cloud. There's a cloud that the scan uploads to and the doctors can sign in and they can pull up their, they can pull up their Itero scan. So it's like, it's, it's like practicing in the future. You know, you're sitting there at the laptop, you have your, you have your 3d model of the, of the patient in one tab, and then you have your Itero digital, models in the other tab and it's like i feel like the amount of dentistry and how comprehensive you can be in your treatment is just it's it's really really advanced and then another thing when you when you're talking about mentoring and how important mentoring is and all that kind of stuff you know i just want to you know remind kids like okay so you're talking about care stream well you're in tallahassee i mean just you're just right down the street from atlanta and um, dentists always know that they should be networking more with oral surgeons or endodontists, or whatever. I tell them to always network with their insurance providers. That was one of the first person I networked. This is the guy giving me all the money. I didn't want him to not know me from a police lineup. And I went down and I took Ed Judd out to lunch and dinner. And, and whenever um, his girls had a problem with something I was doing, they called my girls and and I, I, I tried to foster my people and his people and me and Loria drove down there and visit them all. I mean, you know, you got to network. So if you're in Tallahassee, Florida, and you're thinking about buying a CareStream, well, monetize that relationship. I mean, I wouldn't give CareStream um, a dollar if I lived in Florida and they're in Atlanta. I'd rather give her a dollar to her face. I'd rather, I'd rather the CEO take the order from me. You know what I mean? Because when you get a big, big company um, who knows, you know, that that's all they do. Um, my gosh, uh, so many great things can come out of that. And uh, um, have you been to the care stream in Atlanta? No, I have not. And I think, I think networking with your insurance providers is brilliant. You know, I think I feel like I need to improve on that myself because I, and again, too, I think with like Delta dental, I think there's such a huge volume of patients that I feel like I wish I could, you know, get in the door with them and be like, Hey, you know, maybe could we have a little bit higher fees? Cause I'd be happy to accommodate all the patients that are just dying to come in. But I think networking with insurance providers would just, is a brilliant idea. Howard. Well, I mean, um, well, let, let's talk a couple of things. Number one, you know, um, David Westgate's chairman, president, CEO of CareStreams Health Global Division, and he's right up the street from you. Just to have a friend like that, who's the chairman, president, CEO of a global company with 6,000 employees in 150 countries, you never know where that relationship's going. Um, a lot of people don't know the original story of um, Rick Workman of um, of um, Heartland Dental. I mean, the guy was a genius, and when he was doing his demographics, he thought, well, why, how do I do demographics? Wouldn't the easiest thing to do be, I'm in Illinois, he's in Illinois. So he went to the Illinois Dental, Delta Dental and Blue Cross and Blue Shield and Prudential and says, well, do you sell like state contracts for like all the state employees of whatever? And then you sell that contract and you get complaints because there's nobody to do the dentistry with that insurance in certain towns. And the guy says, are you kidding me? There's 10 towns that are a nightmare. And Rick said, well, where are they? And the guy told him and he says, well, 
you know, I can get an office up and running for definitely under a million, but you know, if you co sign me a loan for ten million dollars, I'll have ten dental offices in those ten cities taking your insurance in four months. And the guy's like, <laughs> Really? I mean, you know, reverse engineer. Um, people, will, you know, I always tell them that, you know, if, if, when you come into the, the, the Phoenix, you know, they always want to go to Scottsdale because they think that's where all the rich people are. And it's the worst decision they ever make in their whole life uh, because there's a dentist on every corner. And in a rich area, an acre of land, there's only about a, one person living on an acre, maybe two. When you go into the poorest part of town, an acre might have some apartment complex that has 500 people in there. And and um, my, so I always say, well, you know, go straight to Patterson. Shine Burkhart Benko and go sh- press the flesh. You're always running for mayor. Shake the press the flesh with the branch manager and say, Hey, where are all your dentists that are in trouble? They're behind 30, 60, 90 in your account receivables. And where's all your dentists that are buying stuff, especially adding operatories? And they'll say, Well, all my nightmares are in North Scottsdale. <laughs> and I can't keep up with the growth in West Phoenix and Eloy and Maricopa and all that. And then they'll say, well, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to live in Maricopa. It's like, oh, okay. Then just say you don't want to be rich. I mean, just, just and, and because if you want to be rich, you could live in Scottsdale and commute to Maricopa. I mean, duh. I mean, you know, uh, and and we're around the corner from driverless cars, which was tested right here in Phoenix. And by the way, crazy humans during that five year study, Google's car, what, what's that app called? The, uh, Waymo. Waymo, thank you. Waymo, which is owned by Alphabet, which owns Google and YouTube and all that stuff, whatever. Um, my gosh, during the five-year deal, not one Waymo car, autonomous driver, killed anybody. But in the meantime, 100 Americans per day were killed by a car driven by a crazy monkey who lost his tail. I mean, but but where are they all? They're afraid of flying, where... One person died last year and 36,000 died driving a car. So people are not rational. And it's a neat thing that I've lived through because when I was classically trained in economics at Creighton, um, you know, they said that markets were rational and all the all the information was worked into the market. And then the naysayers would say, well, then explain Black Thursday, Black Monday, 1929. Explain the Y2K crash, the Lehman's crash. If everything's so rational and perfect... And so about nine or 10 years ago, they gave out a Nobel Prize in economics for some guy trying to get him to go into psychology to realize, well, if economics is rational, well, you know, you know, Frank ain't rational. He's batshit crazy. And now they gave last year's Nobel Prize in economics to another guy. So they're they're showing a trend here. We're going to start giving them to people who mix economics with human psychology because markets can only be as rational as the nut job making the irrational decision. And people are not rational. They're not rational about brushing, flossing, flying, look at the vaccine, everything. They're just not rational. And um, my gosh, um, you know, um, networking with these people who know how to navigate, like like, like take David Westgate. I mean, he's leading 6,000 people in 150 um, countries. How far How far is, um, is um, Atlanta from you in Tallahassee? What is that, about a three-hour drive? It's five hours. Honestly, if you'd ever want to make the introduction, I'd be more than happy to meet him because I'm just all about networking and just, oh, dude. You, you learn, you learn so much from these, these leaders, you know, the leaders that are part of these executive groups and these corporate, these corporations, it's just astounding. Like, we you know what they've accomplished. So. And, and, and back to that driverless car, the, the Waymo, the number one problem that, that Waymo had was that when humans saw the driverless car drive by, they threw rocks at it. I mean, this is a primitive behavior. I mean, that that we're we're, we're humans. I mean, we always said abs- he always said we're all monkeys, right? We're all just monkeys. We're all <laughs> monkeys who lost our tail, and people think that's an insult. I mean, what else could you be? A unicorn or a mermaid? I mean, you know, it, 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 you got to keep it real and networking with people who learn how to um, navigate the other crazy people in the playground. The, those are always your winners. I want to ask you this question. I want to see what you thought of this. This new grad, um, new owner, he writes, new grad, new owner, need help. I have worked through negotiations. My offer is accepted. And I find out tomorrow on the exact terms of financing. I will begin working prior to closing and my start date will be later this week. So here it goes. No real world clinical experience. Never really managed employees. Obviously never owned, operated dental practice. The purpose of this thread is to have experienced owners or advice pearls tricks of the trade that make owning a practice easier, more fun, things to watch out for. Any pearls you found to help during your time as owners 
And what I'm getting at is um, you graduated from school. What? How many years ago? 2015. So you're just, you're just a five year, five year kid out of school. And in school, they look at that ownership thing as frightening. So they run mm-hmm. for a job because all, all of a sudden that to, to be owner operated is just like over, you know, that that's, that's too much at once. So how do you help a kid going from that sounds frightening to, Oh, I'm finally, I own my own dental office. I think that, I think that's very brave to, to buy a, a practice straight out of school, um, especially when you don't have any real world clinical experience. And I was, I mean, me personally, I have five offices and I, I practiced as an associate for, for two years and as a contractor for another year to try to gain experience. So I think, I think the clinical development part is one of the most crucial parts in becoming a good dentist owner. But as for the gentleman that just bought his office, I think one of the biggest thing is, is to go into that office as a servant and show that your staff, your office manager, you know, the patients, the selling doctor, that you're there to elevate the practice and you're there to help them provide, you know, superior care and a high amount of care for, for patients at that office. I think you have to have a very humble attitude going in. You have to be diplomatic, but you have to be very firm. You know, you, you obviously have to be firm, but it's very important to go in. You have to be warm and you have to build relationships with the staff. And again, to back to what you were saying about the office manager being the heartbeat of the office, you really have to have a very good relationship with that office manager. And then there's, you know, getting credentialed for insurance. There's, there's, you know, establishing relationships with the supply companies. There's establishing relationships with the lab. There's, it's very critical too. I would think, especially if the, the selling doctor is staying, that you have a good relationship with him for the temporary amount of time he's there. So those are just kind of the, the, my few tidbits. Okay, so then I'm going to throw it right back. I'm going to serve tennis. You know, never, ever, ever date a tennis player because obviously they don't value love. <laughs> Kyle just gave me the oh dad look. Um, so th- so then her question is going to be GPRs. Do you, are you recommending then a GPR? I mean, if you're going to come out of dental school and you buy an office or a GPR, I mean, what what do you think about GPRs? Um, I think that there's really amazing GPRs. You know, I think I've, there's some GPRs when you go and you do an extensive amount of surgery and you deal with a lot of different complications. And then I think obviously, you know, you and me both know that there's GPRs that are more like cupcake GPRs where it's like a, you know, a fifth year of dental school. Um, so it depends on which, which one you're going to go to. I think if you're not going to go to the elite, I think your best option is to, you know, work for a small group that's, you know, going to have doctors that support you or to even, you know, go, go to corporate. It might be a good option for you for continuing education, but I would think at least a year, not, if not two years at one of those types of organizations is I think much better than a, than just a, a mid tier GPR, because you're going to get a lot of real world experience and you're going to have other doctors kind of verifying your work. Um, and I think that's the nice thing too, about being in a group office is it kind of creates accountability, Howard, to where, you know, you have other dentists that are, you know, we're kind of looking over each other's work, making sure everything's kosher in a sense. So I think that's a great way for, for an individual to learn coming out of school. So, so what do you, um, you know, the dentist has to, you know, they, they get scared. I, I saw this in which I was born and raised in Wichita, Kansas. I'll never forget when uh, it got its first DSL. And here, here's a town of a third of a million people, hundreds of dental offices. And they just, I mean, it was like, ima- imagine uh, those ox monks circled, you know, and there's just like, a little penguin just walks into the the barn. I mean, they were so freaked out. Um, you're um, a small emerging DSO. Um, how do you, um, what, what, first of all, what do you think about the small emerging DSOs? Because some of them are self defeat It's like, well, this industry has already been declared by Aspen, Heartland, and, and uh, you know, um, Pacific. Uh, they already own the market. There's only going to be a Walgreens and a CVS. It'll probably just be Heartland and Aspen. Um, and you're a small emerging DSO, and you you see these titans out there. Um, how 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 do you view these titans? And does that hinder or help or change your thinking as a small five location DSO? I think I think I admire their success and how much they've expanded, but I don't think I necessarily identify with them. I think one thing I, I, I admire their systems and I admire, you know, what they've accomplished, but I also admire, you know, private practice. And I admire that the being involved in the local community and, and having an established name 
and uh, you know, building relationships with with staff and patients. Um, it's nice to it's a fulfilling uh, it's a fulfilling thing to be able to you know go into an office and know the staff and know the patients and remember them. It's like I feel like that uh, the turning door of associates is is not something I I want to become. And sometimes too, you know, you think if if I get to too big that that's going to happen, and that's kind of what I'm trying to prevent. So I'm at a very I'm at an interesting level, interesting size to where it's like, I don't know if I want to really get much bigger. Uh, sometimes I feel like I'm in a sweet spot. So here's kind of something else that's interesting, Howard. I don't know if you've heard of like uh, Richard Evangelista, but he's went from like, you know, like no practices to 45 offices in like five years. Who, who's, and this? I went to, who's this? Richard Evangelista. I think he actually, I think you, you might've interviewed him before. He's, he's got 45 offices by himself out in San Francisco. So anyways, he had a course, okay? And I went to his course and I, I, I brushed shoulders with, with a lot of doctors that had five, 10, 15, 50, um, you know, 60 offices. And it was kind of funny because it was an interesting consensus that I got from them that they, they all kind of said, they're like, you know, that four to five location was kind of the sweet spot. They're like, you know, you're really doing well. You know, it wasn't as organized, but things were going really well, you know, and you still, you still had a good pulse on what was going on with all the employees. And sometimes I think too, like I, I really enjoy the position that I'm in right now. And sometimes I think like, why can't other dentists be in the position that I am right now? Why can't they kind of replicate my model and have, you know, four or five offices? And again, too, dentistry is like a ladder. You're constantly pulling people up to help them, right? And I feel like there's there's going to be a never ending surplus of graduating dental students looking to be mentored, looking to be treated fairly. So I think that there's a huge opportunity um, for an individual to just kind of be just like me to have, you know, four or five offices. And I think that there, I think there's dentists, younger dentists out there that are definitely, you know, they're, they have an entrepreneurial spirit. So maybe if anything, this whole podcast can serve as service and inspiration to them. And what was the main, uh, takeaway with, uh, Richard event is, is, is you pronounce it evangelist? Evangelista. He, it was Evangelista? Kind of funny Evangelista. Yeah. So basically he, he kind of just was like laughing at me when I told him, you know, I had like, you know, three, or th- I had three offices at the time. He's like, man, he's like, that's a walk in the park. He's like, you got this, man. He was just, he was very encouraging. He was just like, yeah, he's like, this is like so easy, man. He's like, you have no idea. It's like, once you start getting to seven, eight, 10, 15, 20 offices, he's like, man, it can really, really get complicated. And it, I don't know. He kind of, he just, it was, that was, it was just an interesting thing, but yeah, he was very encouraging. But one thing too, that he kind of pushed was, um, was having like a, a dashboard that can kind of monitor all your practice numbers, which is, which is definitely an interesting thing. And it's been something that that's helped with me. And like, I, I haven't been like paid by anybody to like say this, but I, I work with Jarvis. I think it's just a good dashboard. I've worked with dental Intel as well. And I, I think for, for my setup, I think that Jarvis is excellent. I love having, you know, um, all my schedules at the tip of my fingers, like constantly being able to monitor the numbers, the collections, the production, um, looking at individual providers to see, you know, how they're doing and just to kind of stay monitor, monitor all the pre-booked appointments and stuff for each of the offices. Cause once you kind of get into a flavor of looking at these offices, it's really critical to have, to have data, instant data, accurate data. So I think that's, that's another thing too, that I, that I learned from Richard. Nice, man. Um, so, um, some DSO housekeeping, um, do you, um, you know, like Aspen, they're all Aspens and they kind of have a franchise model, kind of like a McDonald's. Um, then there's Heartland, um, where, you know, if they go by your dental office and you call it one, two, three dental, they'll, they'll leave it one, two, three dental. Um, um, Kroger does that. Um, Kroger owns, uh, Dylan's here in uh, Kansas. They own fries. Uh, but other grocery stores, um, they like, Walmart, they want all the names um, the same. So what do you do with names? Are they all the same? No, no, no. They're they're not all the same. And I think that's that's really critical. And uh, you know, Harlan, I guess, kind of does that model too. And I remember a long time ago when I was a dental student, I had spoke with Rick Workman on the phone, and he he was definitely an advocate of keeping things, you know, the same, keeping the name the same. Um, but I I keep the name the same, especially in some of these offices that have been around for 30 or 40 years. Why overnight would I change the name of the office? Um, it just, what doesn't make sense. It's kind of like, don't fix it if it isn't broken kind of thing. But for me, it's like, I like, I like my transitions to be as slow and slow as possible. Like I'm, I would rather patients just, it just be a natural thing where they come in, they start coming in and it's, you know, they're just liking it. And then the doctor's there and they're, they see them cause you know, the senior doctor's available. And then all of a sudden it just, it is what it is. But I, I keep, I keep my offices this, the same name that they are. I do not change them. 
Yeah, and um, you know, and again, I, I'm I'm trying to get you know um, people off to, you know, when they make decisions, you know, right or wrong, you know, it's always it's always that, and um, it, it's a trade off. Um, the trade off is, you know, when you got a really big brand and you move into town, they're like, I, I remember when Wichita, uh, Kansas, the governor um, called Herb Keller and said, "We'll buy you the Boeing seven thirty seven free if you start flying out of Wichita." I mean, that's how big the brand was at Southwest Airlines. But if but when something goes wrong with a um, like like Chipotle, you know, when somebody you know eats it and and poops too much, uh, you know, it hurts the whole brand. So if um, if something goes south, it's nice to own a hundred dental offices and no one knows they're all related. <laughs> um, so it's it's uh, it's great for marketing, and it's bad during disasters. Um, again, too, I think I think that um, I think that that model does work though. I feel like you know in a high higher volume area where people are just looking for in and out service and they're looking for a quick predictable service that maybe you know labeling it like that so you kind of get that name that you're just like you know the go to one stop shop. You're in and out. And then there's definitely a type of patient that's looking for that type of office. But I think if you're trying to drive a more relationship um, driven, comprehensive treatment driven office, you got to You got to keep things the same because especially these smaller towns, you know, Howard, that, you know, your, your name and your reputation really, really holds a lot of value. Oh my gosh. Doesn't it though? So, so I, I guess there's my, uh, my final question. I can't believe we went over an hour, but what is, what is your long-term goal? I mean, you got three to five offices. You've only been out of school five years and I mean, you're doing so well, but you're so young. Where, where do you want to be at long-term? I'm not, I'm not sure. I think, I think right now I really do enjoy where I'm at. Um, I like being able, being able to, to practice more casually, to be able to mentor Sometimes I feel like, you know, I, I enjoy what I'm doing right now so much that I, I wouldn't mind just continuing doing it. Um, you know, will, will we get bigger? I don't know. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe if I find another partner that comes in and really wants to just like, man, dude, there's so much opportunity. Let's, you know, let's push this thing bigger. But right now I think I'm relatively, relatively content because I think I have some pretty good flexibility. And I think considering that I do own this operation by myself, it's not, it's not too stressful. It's not too bad. Um, but long term, man, it's like, you know, I think about, think about five years from now. Um, I don't know who, I, I don't know if you've heard that Matthew McConaughey speech, but it's like, who's your hero. And yeah. he always talks about, you know, your, your hero is you five years from now. Um, and that's, I'm just, I guess I'm just trying to constantly improve, um, and become a better person five years from now. So that's kind of where, where my future is. And that's kind of what I'm aiming for, but who knows, you know, I just, you never know who's going to join you and you never know who else, who else is going to step into your life. You never know what kind of introductions are going to happen from this. And, you know, who knows, maybe I'll meet the CEO of CareStream, but I think, uh, I think in general, I'm just, I'm kind of just enjoying the journey right now. Um, and I'm, I'm enjoying the relationships that I have. And I, I really enjoy the respect and culture that I have with my doctors. Well, I just want I just want to, um, here's what, here's what I recommend. McDonald's, one of the biggest franchise brand names ever. And people always forget the story about how, you know, they, they spent, you know, a decade with their first nine and they had to close some and, you know, they, they spent a decade working out their kinks. And when I look at, when I, when I look at this journey, there's the independent dentist and um, you know, there's, it's, it's going to turn into a partnership someday because you know, he's going to die. So eventually he's going to die and it's going to have to be, the practice is going to be transferred and acquired by someone else. So we're not going to get away from uh, death and taxes. And so then it goes to group practice and, um, and that's a big jump. That's, you know, that's the one to the next scale. Now you got a group practice and you got to, um, you know, how do you work with associates, office manager, whatever. And then you get to five locations and that's where that's the best place to just base out. I mean, base out to where, because what I love about uh, what you've got so far is that when you're one guy and you own a dental office, you got to wear every hat. You got to be the marketing person, the staff person, the motivating. I mean, every hat fits on your head and that limits your growth exactly limits your growth so when you get a one layer of management um like i have you know you got um i got um you know stacy's the comptroller and she's got a couple people helping her i got a marketing chris and marketing i got you know you you get this team and after um you know the, the, the founder, their, their job is to have the vision that, okay, we're in Tallahassee and we are definitely headed to Atlanta and we're not headed towards El Paso. So that's just, we're here and we're going to be there. That's the only job 
of the leader, the visionary. We're in Phoenix, Arizona, and we're going to Albuquerque. We are not going to L.A. Okay, so you got that. Then you need to hire these people who, once you say we're going to Albuquerque, well, I could drop dead and my team could figure out, well, are we going to fly? Are we going to drive? Are we going to rent a bus? How are we going to get there? What happens if there's a flat tire? They'll be resourceful. They'll get on the internet. They'll find AAA, whatever the hell. Um, and what you'll find is that... Um, you got to see who they start uh, picking, you know. Um, when I go into these dental offices and no one's worked there three years, you know, Doc's been doing all the HR and hiring and firing for 30 years. And, you know, if he worked for the Miami Dolphins, they'd say, dude, the last three quarterbacks you picked couldn't catch a ball. We're taking that away from you right now. So then you get a team. So they, they got your vision, they got your culture, and then they start hiring people. And there's rapid turnover in the short term that, oh, we got the wrong guy. And then um, um, and that's probably an obvious, like a, a D or F player. And then you get someone closer, someone who stays with you in that one to five year range where they, and those are the toughest calls because those aren't the obvious D and F. Those are C and B. You know, if they, they're about a year or less, it was a C player. If they're there about five years, that's the toughest call. That was a B player. And then when they've made it five years and they're still on the team and they hurt everybody and they get along, now you know you got another five year A player and the founder can die and this team goes on. And now I'm sitting here with, you know, half dozen people who've been here 20 years. So what you need to do at five is, um, my gosh, what you need to do at five is establish your first layer. Who is the accounting person? Who is the marketing person? Who is the legal person? You know, um, basically, you need HR and you need marketing and you need accounting. That that those are the three heads. If there ever were three wise men, it'd be HR, accounting, um, HR, accounting, and um, uh, what was the other one I just said? Marketing. Marketing. Yeah. And, um, and the marketing is a drug. It's like getting hooked on heroin because yeah. the best marketing is when you're trapped in a small town like Walmart and he had to change all of his policies because there's only 5,000 people there. So when he said, well, we, we don't take returns. And a mother looks at him and says, well, I assure you that me and my husband and three kids will never walk in this store again. And then he goes home and coughs up a blood clot until he finds out that, okay, he is going to take returns. And then when that salesman comes by once a month and tries to sell him a box of Ted Moore shoes, he's going to say, well, you're taking this one back because I sold it to Margaret and the damn heel fell off. And she's quite pissed about it. And she took it back. And she made me take it back. So I'm going to make you take it back. And that's the point in his life where he based out like, like um, Procter & Gamble wouldn't um, – change a thing for him and when Procter and Gamble finally realized they messed up and this guy's in 32 states and he will not even take a phone call from Procter and Gamble go to Bentonville Arkansas my dad went and showed me the lesson P&G thought well here's what we're gonna do we're gonna move our office down there because maybe when we all live down there maybe someone going to church with Billy and going to the same school as Alan and maybe if they just see we're not evil like they all think we are and it took another long time before Sam even thought about buying one paper towel from Procter & Gamble because they got off on the wrong start. So what you need to do is you need to base out your team. You need to get that HR and that marketing. The marketing, remember, it's a drug because why, where are your existing patients? You're getting 25 new patients a month for the last five years. My God, you should have four full-time hygienists going 40 hours a week and you only have one going three days a week. What, we just need to dump more innocent victims onto this batshit crazy dental office? Get it so that... Marketing is gravy, not what I need to survive. What you need to survive is word of mouth referral where you keep your, your employees and you keep your patients. And if you can't keep your employees, you're not going to keep your patients. And if you can't keep your patients, you're not going to keep your employees. And then, and then you build up that person where you're sending this one to all the accounting stuff and this one to all the HR stuff and this one to all the marketing. Then five can turn into 10 in a year. And the next year, 10 can turn into 20. And the next year, 20 turns into 40 to 80 to 160. And the next thing you know, you're coast to coast. But everybody goes under 
between three and five locations because their goal is to get to 20 locations instead of having an absolute factual working business model. And then the other problem is, is that when you have that one headquarter, one layer, you can profitably grow in profits. But when you sell out to another layer where your your management team, say was taking 5% off, and then you sell to these average DSOs and they need another 17% off the top, shit, I don't even pay 17% for lab and supplies so what are you going to do for me second layer that's better than just giving me free free lab and supplies and that's why they can't go public because they grow their sales at the same speed as their debt well how did they go from a million to a billion well they got a million dollars they bought a million dollar dental office and now they say look we went from zero to a million then they go get 10 million of debt by 10 million dollars like we went from zero to one and then one to ten in just two years yeah dude but your balance sheet showing 11 million dollars of debt and by the time they get to a hundred million dollars they got a hundred million dollars of debt and that wouldn't fly on shark tank could you imagine trying to explain that to mr wonderful he'd slap you all the way back to canada Uh, if you even tried to pitch him he'd slap you for that um he'd say you're dead to me knack uh is that how you pronounce uh nathan allen cover um and uh your company knack is am i yeah yeah we have a knack for we have a knack for dentistry that's what i like to say (laughs) oh okay well you're you're uh, my uh my favorite band when I was your age was The Knack singing My Sharona. So maybe you can get a little d- dental tooth. And name there we Sharona. go. There we go. <laughs> but so what I would do, what I would do is I would, you, you bit off more than you can chew. So dude, base out, make sure you got, I mean, if you got the best HR and the best accounting and the best marketing and, you know, Natives young from Tallahassee, they they um, they admire they like the vision, they feel the purpose. Be- because if you're really going to scale, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to have to give you 10, 20, 30, 40 years of their life. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, when you say Bill Gates is the richest man in the world for a long time, well, he made 10,000 millionaires that were with him for a long, long damn time to get to that level of billion. So, so you need the three wise men, and um, I, I prefer them. Uh, um, I don't care if they're off street. I don't give a shit. They have a degree. A degree doesn't. You know, usually a BS stands for bullshit. A MS stands for more more shit. And a PhD <laughs> is piled higher and deeper. I mean, look at Ultradet. They've never had one PhD in their department because everyone they've hired just turned out to be a complete moron that can't think. Um, you know, um, like uh, like like when I came out of dental school, what 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 class in dental school would possess me to start Dental Town? I mean, you know, that that's that's not a class. That that's listening to your customer. That's listening to yourself. That's sitting there hearing Dennis saying, Well, God, I can get on ESPN and talk about football at three in the morning, but there's no place to do that with a root canal. And I'm like, dude, I hear you. And I bet every damn thing I had on it. And it worked because it was true to my heart. It was true to other Dennis Hart. And it's still a true thing to this day. So you need to find someone in HR accounting. And marketing that's that you think is going to give you 5, 10, 20 years of your life and you're going to base out and you're going to get those dashboards and you're going to get it. So so instead of sitting there and thinking, well, you know, we're going to go from 5 to 6. Oh, forget that. No, your next move is 5 to 10 to 20 to 40 to 80 to 160. So the real question is, how long do you need to base out your 5 before you're willing to let that thing divide like a fungi into 10. And McDonald's, they took 10 years to do that. So get your shit together. Get it to where <laughs> it's a no-brainer. Stay geographically close. I mean, Southwest Airlines, I mean, they're the, you know, you don't have five in Tallahassee, then put five in Dallas. That doesn't make any sense. So I would so you're never even going to leave Florida. There, Florida's big enough for a DSO with 500 locations. And, and on, I'll prove that um, everybody knows Glidewell, Jim Glidewell. He has 5% of the dental market, but he has 5% of the whole country. There were some other people that had interesting. There was a green dental lab in Arkansas who one-third of every dentist in Arkansas gave him the lab, and the other one was Lord's Dental Studio. He had one-third of all the dentists in, in um, Wisconsin sending his lab work. So, so... You know, here's Jim Glidewell where we're going to have a low price and a lot of great marketing. And we'll get one out of a 20 out of the richest economy in the world. Great business strategy. Then the local small guy said, well, I can't compete with Jim Glidewell in Arkansas. 
and uh, um, God, what was his name? Jerry Reed, Jimmy Reed. Let me let me just uh, type in. Uh, um, oh, I feel like labs. God. I feel like labs in general are starting to get a lot more competitive. I think. Um, I think digital dentistry too. The digital scans is lowering the cost of making making uh, crowns too. So. Yeah. So so you know th- there was a guy where he just thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to I'm going to be small. And I'm just going to think about um, Wisconsin and I'm not going to um, um, I'm not going to think national global. So it's one step at a time. So you got five. So I, I want to see who your Tom Brady is. I want to see who your Gronk is. I want to see I want to see your three amazing players for those three positions to where you guys just sit there and say, oh, yeah, this is. And then you might also do it with M&A activity. Um, you know, mergers and acquisitions. So when you're ready to go from five to 10, you just buy five, the, the five down the street. But, but I think you're off to an amazing start. I also think it's, um, humans are, um, very quiet and shy. I mean, we all started out on the Eastern Horn of Africa and the mother-in-law effect was, well, let's, let's move a little further away. And 200,000 years later, we're from Australia to Argentina, just proof that people don't like to live really close to other people and that everybody gets on their nerves. I mean, you see a bird, a woodpecker making that little house just for him. He's not making a big one to try to get five woodpeckers in there. And um, so start small, base out, make sure you got your team. Um, you, you can uh, pass the ball, no look passes because you know where your other guy is going to be. And uh, man, you're, you're off to a great start and, um, and you're not shy and you were able to come on and um share your story that takes a lot yeah. of balls a lot of guts uh, and so uh i just love everything you're doing and uh i um and um my gosh if i could just end up someday with your hair before i go uh that would be uh can, can you do that howard, you just- howard man i'm just i'm really flattered that you invited me to come on the show man it means a lot just from you know us initially meeting and you lecturing and me being here now and i really appreciate your encouragement and i'm i'm hoping that um hoping that this can help spread the word of Mac Dental and you know, final, see, final see, question. See what happens. Final question. I'm going to ask it at the end because you say, oh, I don't, I don't want to answer that question. Um, we'll, we'll cut it out. You don't even have to answer it. We could have said goodbye. But the last one, punching below the belt. When Rick Workman started Heartland, I could tell as a human that it, it really hurt his feelings how dist he was by his local dental schools. And I mean, they, they were just really mean to him. You came out of Nova. Uh, Stephen Kaltman uh, is the, the dean. When he hears you're doing a DSO, is he like, damn it, I thought that was a good kid. What is he doing over there playing with the devil? Or is, is he. Does, does, no, or, does Nova have a new dean? Well, it, it, I thought it was Stephen Kaltman. Who, who did you. And it used to be Dean Neeson. It was they switched. They oh switched yeah, 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 times. yeah. Neeson left years ago. Oh, oh. So let's let's say it was Neeson or any dean you know. But the um back in the day, dental school deans did not like any of their alumni that got into this DSO business. It's kind of like yeah. the, the mafia. Remember when the mafia they were into like uh whatever the mafia did, but the younger guys started doing drugs, selling drugs, and the old guys, you know, they did not go for that at all. They said it's only supposed to be. Gambling and prostitutes. What is this marijuana <laughs> crap? Um, but do you do you feel like the D the your dental school Nova is uh, open to innovation, or do you feel it's old school that's like uh, trying to I think, get away from those? Things? I, th- I, th- I think they're old school. I mean, I think they're trying to you know um, I think they're trying to teach traditional clinicians, and they're trying to be academic. Um, but yeah, you know, I definitely <laughs> I definitely gave my. Um, <laughs> definitely gave some of my staff uh, an interesting time when I was in dental school. So, but <laughs> at, <laughs> at, at the end of the day, they definitely, they definitely won't forget me. They definitely will remember me. That's for sure. Well, I won't forget either. Dr. Nathan Adam Kupperman, the second DMD. I'm a second too. Did you know that? We're, I did. Yeah. Um, my dad was Howard Eugene Ferran. And he named me Howard Eugene Fran the second. It was so confusing that everybody just started calling my dad by his middle name Gene and started calling me a mistake. Uh, did you uh, did you find it very confusing being the second? Was was your mom always giving your mail to your dad? <laughs> Honestly, it was my grandpa that was that was the first. So the guy that was a dentist during the Great Depression. So are you going to have a third? Uh, hopefully. <laughs> I mean, are you going to make it to third? No, 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 no rush though, man. He told me I'm the smartest man in the world for not getting married. So, uh, yeah, you don't need to until you make a little one. But on that note, Nathan, thank you so much for coming on the show. All right. Thank you, Howard. You take care, man. Thank you again.